other people. Sarah, Nancy, uh, other Sarah, um, uh, you know, Marilyn, a lot of friends here, a lot of people from Antioch, a lot of people from um, the Trees in the Spirit too, so it's really great to be here. I've worked at Fairfield about two years, and I've driven by this church many times, and it's really nice to come in and meet you all. All right, so I'll be talking today about um, Piney Swamp community, which is sort of a broader area around Antioch. It's not just Antioch. We're sort of learning together what Piney Swamp is. Okay. I'll go to the next slide. That'd be great. Thank you. So anyway, yeah, Fairfield Foundation, just to give you a background on who we are. Uh, we do archaeology, we do preservation, we do all kinds of, of uh, public engagement. We have five different sites. Fairfield Archaeology Park on the top left, that sign and the property is about 300 feet that way. So go and visit sometime, we'd love to have you. Um, it is an archaeological site, there's nothing left but the ruins of the house, but we do archaeology programs there. Timber deck on the bottom left. Uh, we do a lot of preservation workshops, so we'll look at the, uh, the old structure, we'll try to evaluate what's going on with the bricks, with the windows, with the frame, see what needs to be repaired. And we have three other sites, uh, Walter Reed, Rosewell, and the uh, Texaco gas station in town. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to start off by looking at this aerial photograph. It was taken back in 2014, but I, here's a, I found this on the computer today. I didn't know we had it, and I was really excited. Because in the dead center, you see that green patch of grass? That's the Fairfield ruin. But if you follow the road behind it, through the trees, you can actually see Antioch Church in that same picture. So this sort of encapsulates to me what the nature is of Fairfield, this plantation which you know, spawns to all these different communities in one photograph. Um, I, you can see the church. I wish I had blown up the image, but if you all would like a higher quality, I'm happy to ask if we can get that to you. But you can sure enough see the church in that picture. And so to me, that's really special. Off into the background and to the right, that is Piney Swamp. That is all the land that is behind the church. Or sorry, that direction. Uh, next one, please. So where's Piney Swamp? What is it? Um, many of us, you know, you go to Antioch Church or you're driving down the road to your house, you don't really know that it's there, so to speak. You know, there's a Piney Swamp Road, there's a community there, but what is the actual swamp is what I mean. That's what you don't actually know where it is. I always thought of Piney Swamp as being immediately here in front of the church. But as it turns out, technically speaking, Piney Swamp is way up the road on Piney Swamp Road going towards Marketplace Antiques and all that area. Um, this is a 1906 map, and this will be really important later on. Um, the 1906 topos were the first uh, topographic survey done of this caliber. Um, you have phenomenal detail, and in this early year they capture things that are no longer there. Roads. The majority of the roads you see in that image on the right are no longer there. Very, in fact, I would argue maybe half of them are gone. Um, and we'll look at it a little bit later. There's a blown up image, but on this, you can't even see Antioch because it wasn't three yet. Uh, next, please. This is a more modern, just to give you an idea where Piney Swamp is. So you see Antioch Church um, sort of uh, in the middle of the left a little bit, sort of right, yeah, thank you, right at the fork of, uh, fork of the roads. Uh, one goes down to Cope, one goes to Bridges, and the other way on that road goes to Quantum. Uh, when you hear those names, you see them on the map, and you think, well, there must be a town there. But that's not, uh, that's sort of one thing we're sort of learning a little bit. Where, what are these communities? Uh, but anyway, Piney Swamp is way up on Piney Swamp Road. Antioch is part of that Piney Swamp community we're learning. But the community is not just at the actual swamp. You can drive over it, and there's not much there. Um, the next slide, please. So anyway, uh, one thing that we've been looking at a lot of are any sort of map we can look, we can get our hands on, whether it's a survey book, when you get, you know, you buy, you buy property, they'll survey the property, and maybe they'll tell you where some things are on it. Uh, all, we also look at historic aerial photographs and something called LIDAR. Next, please. So this is a map. I was talking with Mr. Bill Lawrence about it earlier. On the left, this is a post office application map. Um, 
when post offices were created back in the day, you would have to submit paperwork to, I guess, the, the, the U.S. government at the time. Um, and every single little town, so Bridges, for example, you know, Zanoni, all these little you know, crossroad communities um, would have to submit an application. And they had an option to put a map in there. Usually they would just you know, draw an X and say, there it is. But for Bridges, they did something really special, which I've not seen anywhere else in the county to this level. They actually put in every, all the different people that lived in the area. This is Piney Swamp. So if you look up, if you look at the image on the right, Mr. Bill Lawrence, um, uh, the very kind of, let me use this in the PowerPoint, he actually went through and he uh, looked at the, the handwriting on the image to the left and typed it out. So that way you can look at it and know what the names are. You can actually get a sense of where things are. This is one of the best maps that we have, actually. Uh, I wish I put a star over Antioch Church, but this is something you can look at later. And look at the roads. The roads are drawn the same way as they exist today. You have property owners, the Montagues, the Paines, the Patterson, the Pointers. These are a lot, a lot of the people that live around this area, and they know these names well. And it's always special to get to, to pass this map along to as many people as we can. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is one other map. It's not nearly as good, but it's the 1912 Folks map. He, uh, he made a map of the entire county. If you ever come by the, uh, the Texaco station I talked about, we call that the Center for Archaeology, Preservation, and Education. We have a, a big version of this in granite, so you can actually walk on top of it and look at it. But they couldn't capture the same detail in maps that we would really like, because we want to be able to tell the stories of who lived here, not just landowners. We want to, you know, we want to know a fuller story. This map is fantastic because it shows you where uh, mills were, where some of the major farms were. Uh, so you have Carter's Creek Farm. That's the same thing as Fairfield, which is right up the street. Uh, it's just a hundred feet Fairfield Lane. That's all Carter's Creek Farm. On this map, you also have Catlett. That's Timberneck. There's another major property. We don't have anything in between. So. We get really interested in seeing these maps and trying to expand upon them and get as many people on them as we can. I right, suppose. So this is an interesting story. The 1906 topo map we looked at earlier, there's something interesting going on with Antioch that we don't quite understand yet. We're really hoping to learn a little bit more about it. So if you look at the image on the bottom left, inside of the red square, you see where the arrow is? there is a road going off into the swamp. And you see where the road is, the little dotted line, it meets a point where there's five or six other roads joined at the same place. So we know that there was something important out there in the swamp. Whether or not that was just a corner of property lines and that just happened to be where all the roadways went, we don't know. But if you look on the right, I've got a blown up version. And on that road, you see symbol for a church. It is erect, it is a square with a cross on top of it. We, we don't know of any churches in that area. So who, who were the people that were meeting here? What was going on here? Um, a little bit above that, you see another square with a cross on top. It's just below the number 36. That is Piney Swamp School, just right up the road. Now back in the day, they would use, sometimes they would use a cross for churches and schools. So we don't entirely know that that wasn't just a school. But what we do know is that Antioch is not on this map. So did the people that practiced that worship at Antioch Church, or a church that Antioch came from, did they worship at this other site? We don't know, but it would be wonderful to help learn a little bit more about the history of this church. Uh, that's one of our little mysteries we're working on. So if you go to the next slide, you can see there's a little bit of a proof of concept for these topos. The little red arrow showing the, the road going off into the, into the swamp, into the mainland. It's, you can actually see the road where the arrow is here in the same place. And if you look closely enough, you can actually follow different cartways going off into the swamp. Uh, Piney Swamp today is, is, is kind of, a, I guess basically it's timberlands, there's not really anything going on out there. I think it's pretty acidic. 
it's pretty wet, there's not great drainage. So historically, we didn't have a lot of agriculture back in there. But we did have people that were crossing through it, as you can see in these images with the cartways. So we were very interested in figuring out who was in that area and why. Uh, can you go to the next one, please? So one other thing we did, and I, I know that um, a lot of these images take a lot more study to really fully appreciate, and I'll be happy to pass along these images later because it's hard to it's hard to get through everything. Um, we took the 1937 aerial photograph and we overlaid it on a map of the present. Fortunately, there's enough detail. Um, say you have a pivotal road crossing, such as that Clopton. I don't think anybody really calls it Clopton, but the maps do. Right at the intersection, that's a solid intersection. Same place as it was in 1937, it is today. So we were able to use a geo-referencing tool and drag that map exactly to the same point. We used 10 of those known points. We're matching up known points from the past to the present to make sure that we're overlaying it properly. And when we did, I then took a line tool and I drew lines where all the roads were in 1937. And when you look at this, you notice there's a lot of overlap where things line up perfectly. But then you have cases where uh, the road, I'm sure I I wish I'd circled it, I'm sorry, but there's a road going off right here, going off to the right, going to Piney's Walk. That road doesn't show up on any aerial photographs. It's not there today. Uh, we don't know what's going on there. A lot of these roads, you'll notice, actually coincide with property lines, which makes sense. Uh, there are a lot of cases where uh, there would be a right-of-way reserved across parcel lines just so people could get to the backfields or whatever. Um, but this is another example of how we're trying to recreate the past landscape to get a better idea for where things were. Because we can look at an old map or an old aerial photograph, but we don't know what we're looking at or put names to the places, it's not as valuable as we'd like. Uh, can you go to the next, please? So this is another one, and the, this one and the one before it with roads are both works in progress. Um, as, you, uh, as you can tell, the, I did put the roads on this one. But the little black circles, the dashed circles, they're tiny, but they're up there. Those are structures that are present in 1937. So we're using the same concept of taking the old map and placing it over an existing map and then comparing against what was there then versus what's here now. We found that there are a number of structures that were there in 1937 that we can't account for. They, they just vanished. You have entire farm complexes. There are people that live back in these areas. Um, so here's a good example. So Antioch Church, you see right at the fork of the roads, is a little bit north of it. But then you look back behind it, and you see about a cluster of five different structures. And again, these are the black, so the black dotted circles. There was some sort of an open field or a farm back in that area, and it's completely gone. Uh, there, there's nothing there now. Uh, there are modern buildings there, but there's no evidence of these historic areas. These historic landscapes, we don't have, we have evidence for it, but we don't know the stories. So we're really interested in, in pursuing this and trying to get as much cover as we can. Because although we are main, our main focus has been on the Fairfield track, uh, it's, sort of, it's sort of that dumbbell track. It's sort of the big one within the yellow polygon. And it crosses over onto both sides of Cedar Bush Road. It's, that's the big one. But we're trying to spread out. We're trying to cover more ground. We're trying to, we're trying to take this you know, all the way to Highway 17, so to speak. Uh, next, please. So one other, one other uh, thing we're looking at is what's called LIDAR. So in topographic maps, you have contour lines. You know. It's very basic, it's very, you know, it, you'll, you'll see, you know, it's 25 feet here and then over here it's, you know, 50 feet. But LIDAR actually recreates that into a three-dimensional landscape where you get really, really accurate uh, differentials in topography. So that's why when you look at this and you see those little, those stream channels, they look like ravines. That's because in a lot of cases they are. LIDAR has enabled us to learn a whole lot more about the area. So if you see... The yellow circle is Antioch, just to get everyone oriented. 
When you look at this, I wish I had blown it up even more, but you can see property line ditches on here. Uh, and that becomes really important a little bit later on. Why we want to know where property line ditches are. Uh, next, please. So this is one other image. This is the heartland, the mainland of Piney Swamp. And as you can tell, in the middle of the image, it's very flat. There's not a whole lot going on. You start to get some rolling hills towards the northeast. I call them rolling hills because I'm from the flatlands. And that is mountainous to me. Uh, but Piney Swamp, as this image shows, is, is very flat. It's not very well drained. There's not a lot you can do out there. Um, but what you do see are a lot of straight lines. And those are ditches. They're boundary ditches in a lot of cases. It's possible there were some attempts to drain the area, so you could do some farming out there. But this is all sort of goes back to the area we're interested in with the Piney Swamp community, this African American community that spawned out of uh, the plantation landscape. Uh, next, please. So, what are some things that maps show us? Yeah, we go to, yeah. So, this is sort of an embarrassing story. Uh, years ago, I was doing some research in college doing flat reconstructions, and I found something I thought meant something. I was really excited because on a survey I was looking at, it said, Grave of Ben Oaks. And there weren't any known cemeteries in the area. So I showed it to my advisor, and I was all excited, and he got even excited. He said, wow, not something new. You know, this is, this is a big deal. Well, he actually looked at the map a month later. If you look at the next slide, you'll see what it said. It's not Grave of Ben Oaks, it's Grove of Pen Oaks. <laughs> really careful. The same thing happened to me with a grapevine that I thought was graveyard. <laughs> My interest has been, I have a lot of interest in cemeteries. And so that's why I look at these key words on plants and I try to remember where it says they are. Because if a map says there's a, a spring here, I want to make sure people remember where that is because they might say, well, you know, you know, maybe there's a moral history of a spring on the property, but it's gone. And you don't know where it is. Well, sometimes these maps can save the day. Uh, next, please. So this is another really fun one that relates more to the Antioch community. So if you look at the map on the left, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's a 1787, yeah, sorry, 1787 plat map of the Fairfield Plantation. And again, that's kind of our main focus, but we're kind of expanding a little bit. We're trying to learn more. Um, the map didn't it didn't quite add up for the longest time because there's not a north arrow on it. But there are meets and bounds in there. They actually give us, the, the surveyor went through and wrote down the exact dimensions of the property. They said, you know, this line is north 87 degrees by 33 poles, which is an old measuring, uh, I think it's like 16 and a half feet. So I took a little bit of translation. But what I did is I took the they gave me the recipe. They gave me exactly how to recreate this, and I did. On the next slide, you'll see when you read, when you overlay that over a current map, it lines up perfectly. The line on the far right it is an existing boundary ditch today. We thought that that boundary may have only gone back to 1848 when there was a later plot that showed that. But when we realized that this, when I realized that this map also showed that ditch, we're now thinking this is a substantially older area. Um, if you can go back to slide real quick, I appreciate it. So it's upside down, but I blew it up and flipped it on the right. It says Orchard Creek. We weren't aware, uh, so the, the, the founders of Fairfield years ago, they saw this plat, uh, Dave and Zane, they're, they're sort of in charge. They knew, they knew that the word orchard was on here, but we don't know of any orchards in the area. So if you go to the next slide, it'll show you exactly where Orchard Creek is. So here we're at Antioch, and there's a creek right behind us. It's sort of a, a stream. But the next creek over, that's in, um, all right, that's Orchard Creek. So when you're going down Fairfield Lane, you will drive over in a little ditch. It's not very substantial at that point because we're close to the headwaters. But that is called Orchard Creek. So we're starting to wonder, where was the orchard? Was it on the north side of the creek or the south side? And we don't know yet. But if anybody tells you about old, you know, fruit, 
uh, trees in the area or anything like that, let us know because we'd love to know where the orchard was if there's anything left of it. Uh, there is a site that we do know about. It was located right where Orchard Creek flows into Carter's Creek. You'll see the word creek. It's right in there. It's sort of a tongue of land. And we think it's a, a slave quarter or something like that for people that may have been on working the Orchard Quarter. Uh, we call it the Orchard Quarter because it's on Orchard Creek. But we need to do a lot more research to find out for sure. Uh, next one. So surveys, deeds, and land tax books. You can lose your mind in this. <laughs> And it's not a bad journey, I must say. So next one. Uh, so I first got interested in this study. Uh, I talked with Mr. Bill Watts about it. And we were just trying to figure out where old plats lined up. You know, where was everything? You know, you've got this old survey from the 1830s. That's cool. But where is it? You have to dig a little bit deeper. So. Looking through these, uh, there was one that referenced Piney Swamp. And recreating it in GIS, you don't always have to. You see all those different words on the outside. On the image on the left, you'll see sort of a weird, almost like a ladle shape. I'm not sure how to describe that. But you see all these different words winding around the edges of it. Those are all the bearings that the surveyor made when they were uh, mapping that out. You, didn't, you don't have to recreate all of that GIS because the parcel today is almost identical. Even though that's a map from the 18, I think, 30s, uh, not every land boundary changes over time. Sometimes they get used over and over and over again. But where this comes in handy, especially for studying the Piney Swamp community, is I went through and I just drew polygons based off the plats to represent the extent of all the different major plantations and farms in the area. So you've got uh, Fairfield, uh, Roosevelt is a little bit far out for this. We've got White Marsh, which is right there at on 17. Abingdon Farm, right at Abingdon Church, there was a farm there at one point. Most people, uh, most people think of Abingdon as being the church, but there's also a farm just north of it. Uh, Woodville, right where the, uh, the school is, Woodville School was part of Woodville Farm. But we put all these in here just so when people think about where they lived and where their grandparents or parents lived in the Piney Swamp area, where it was historically, because it's not all Fairfield land. There were other properties involved too. Um, and so I'm trying to include I tried to broaden this to cover a decent area. So we've got uh, White Marsh, where the shopping center is, um, Ordinary, uh, Fairfield area, and all the way to the northern edge of Timberneck. Because there's a lot of there's a you know, big African American presence in this area, and we want to make you know we want to make it clear that it's not all Fairfield. There's other things going on too. All right, next please. So Antioch Church, um, uh, many of us uh, aren't as familiar with the, with the history of Antioch Church. I didn't look into this until recently, but um, that handwriting on the left, I believe, is my boss thing. So at one point about, well, there's a date. In 2010, they did some deed research in the area, trying to get a better idea where things were at Fairfield. But they went ahead and they did a title search for Antioch Church. Um, and they call it a, um, a chain of title or a, a deed history kind of thing. But we have here on the right the different people that own this property over the years, and I'll walk you through it. So uh, Antioch, the trustees purchased the ground here. It's two-acre tract. It still is today. They purchased it in 1923. The cornerstone, I believe, says 1922. Is that right? All right, cool. So that's another interesting thing, you know, going to church ahead of time. So the person that owned it in 1922, William J. Fields, I think was a trustee. And so that may be how that happened. But this was a, is a two acre track now, but before 1923, it was 12 acres. And it went uh, south a little, a little bit, I believe from the northern edge of that 12 acre parcel. But you go back year by year and you see who owns it. Sure enough, in the 1890s, it was a part of the Fairfield Plantation. And it was sold off 
because the owners of the plantation at the time, the Levitt family, they had bankruptcy. And so they lost pretty much all of their land except for two small parcels. There was one, it was about 40 to 50 acres on the other side of the creek behind us, and that was the Dower Tract. So that's where uh, the, I believe the wife of the person who went bankrupt lived. So by that point, the family that owned Fairfield weren't even living in the main house. That, had, that was gone. But they still had a seat of power in this area, and that was just right over there. But the second tract, that was also Dower Tract, that stayed in the family a little bit longer before that was also out for bankruptcy, was the Wood Tract. That's where we are. This was a 12-acre tract of woods. They wanted to make sure that there was wood for firewood purposes like that. So we have reason to think that this was a wooded lot from probably the 1920s or so back before, and it's hard to trace it back before then. Uh, next, please. Oh, sorry, the other way, if you could. There we go, yeah, thank you. So this is another great map. Uh, this dates to, I believe, 1893 or 4. I'm probably way off on that. But this is the bankruptcy cell map. And this was the point in time where you had, this is the southern half of Fairfield. And it was all sold off primarily to African Americans, many of whom were formerly enslaved on the Fairfield plantation. But on this map, you have so many names of people that, that still have their families that are still around today. The Deadmans, for example, are out here. I think uh, the pointers, the carries, Miles Carey is on here. This is another great map to just lose yourself in because it, it just represents a moment in time where African Americans now were owning land here. And if you go to the next one, you'll see where we are. So the image on the left is a blow up of the previous map, and the little star in the top right corner is Antioch. Uh, that was, yeah, that was the 12 acre tower track. And immediately south of us was where Lawrence Whitey lived. Um, I believe Robert Patterson lived north of us. Nathaniel Crow was here. He could tell us all about uh, all about the Pattersons. Um, you look over on the right, and there's that. There's just a modern overlay to give you an idea. So this was the original tract of land that Antioch Church was on. Uh, oh, one other interesting thing. You'll notice on the image to the left. Just above the star, there's a road. That road is long gone, but it used to be there were two roads to Fairfield. There's the road, Fairfield Lane, that's there today, and then a road just south of it. That's that road. It's no longer there. But that road went directly to the wharf on Carter's Creek. So there's a lot of, there's, you know, questioning about why exactly that road was so important. If it went straight to the main road, that may have been this this point of land right here where Antioch sits in, right where this road went straight to the water, was probably a very important area in the past. Can you go to the next one, please? Uh, so we then get into reconstructing the land ownership. We're um, we're trying to, you know, like I said, get a big picture. You know, who lived where? When did they live there? We're trying to really advance everything. Next, please. So, um, actually, Sarah Lewis was, uh, worked on this a little while ago. This is a um, land, or she worked on the, a pamphlet that this was a part of. So this was something that Fairfield did years ago, uh, where they did a land trace of the different parcels on the Fairfield landscape, and actually figured out who lived on each parcel over time. Um, and you, again, you get all these names of people that were enslaved here, um, such as Achilles Johnson. He's on there, and he lived right up near the mill. So, again, we're really trying to ex rapidly expand our knowledge of this area just from the maps. We're just trying to figure out who, who lived where, what, what did they do? Uh, Kelly Johnson um, lived right up by the mill. Did he, what, was he a mill right? You know, there's so much we can learn from this. Next, please. So this didn't uh, show up quite as well as I would like, but we can, we can make additional copies available so people can get a better idea where things are. Get a, get a jump started on the research we've already done. Um, but we're trying to take these plaques and overlay them so we can, you know, see what's there. Because the plaques overlaid so perfectly because they were surveyed in, we can reconstruct where even small parcels were 
throughout the landscape. So you don't see Antioch Church on, oh, I'm sorry, you do. It's still the tower track. But the wonderful thing about Platts is that all the surveys were done so well, you can just drag and drop it onto a current map if you, if you do it the right way. And then what we're trying to do is develop this into a, a program where you can actually click and drag a time slider, and it will change each polygon, each shape, to represent who owned the property at that specific year. That's a great goal, I think, but it's still not complete because not everybody owned land. So how do we figure that out? Um, you look at the census records, find out, try to reconstruct how people were walking down the street. Well, that works to a point. Um, you also have agricultural schedules, and they tell you exactly what people were growing on their farm. It tells you the names of people that didn't even own the property. They just were working there and living there. So there's all kinds of avenues of research we can get into. Right, next please. So, one of the final big questions is, what is Pioneer Swamp? We know it was a, a region. We know it's a geographical landmass or a, a swamp, uh, but it was a community too. Uh, we're trying to, you know, help you know spread some of the tools that we know so people can you know kind of explore on their own too. But it was Pioneer Swamp? It doesn't show up on a map, I don't think, as a community. But it was. It was an area. It wasn't, it didn't have a post office. Maybe that's why it didn't show up on the map. But it was a community <coughs> nonetheless. So we kind of ask ourselves, you know, we like to put things into boxes. You know, what's the community? What's the size and scale? Uh, Gloucester has city limits, for example. We can't put city limits on Piney Swamp because it's not how it works. Uh, if you go to the next one, we have four different random polygons I drew up just to give an idea of why, you know, just to float, you know, float in the back of your mind and say maybe that's the Piney Swamp community. But you notice about a lot of them is that they don't even include Piney Swamp because we're, we're interested in the people, not the swamp. Um, this here, you see the red polygon in the middle, it sort of looks like a scrunched version of California. That is, um, Bridges, that's the Bridges community. If you go to the next slide, please. It gets a little bit bigger because when we talk to people, when people talk about Piney Swamp, I want, you know, cousins live down this road where they know that somebody lived in this area. When they click the back because they're part of the community, well, then it gets a lot bigger. Um, in this map, we just tried to say, let's just say the community stops at Timberneck Farm. Let's say it doesn't go quite all the way to 17 but it does follow Timberneck Creek. Maybe it's logical, but is it true? Maybe it's just the wrong way of looking at it. Let's go to the next one. And then we take that and we just stretch it all the way to Carter's Creek to include Fairfield. No, sorry, just south of Fairfield. Then we go to the next one. Maybe we can include Clockwood. But this is really just the wrong way of looking at it because you can't necessarily always put a boundary on these places. There not always is a boundary. It's not always a crystal clear boundary, that's for certain. Sometimes it's very vague and amorphous. But again, uh, let me go to the next one, kind of close up here. Uh, we're, we want to try to reconstruct as much of this as possible and make sure people you know, know what the where the tools are and know that we're interested. Uh, we want to be able to help share this with people so they can say, where their grandparents lived, and maybe they don't know, they just know it's in an area. They need somebody to run to the courthouse and pull the deed and figure out where it is. Uh, there's a lot of cemeteries in the area. Getting this information out there is valuable to them, um, just for general awareness. But it also is deeply intellectual, too. I mean, it's not just about the, the plats and the surveys and the really fascinating ways of looking back to the 1600s, who owned land where. But it's, it's about the, the deeper questions, you know, social and economic and stuff like that. But uh, in closing, I do have somewhere, oh, here it is. I have a printed out map on cardboard. Uh, and I just wanted to have this around in case anybody wanted to put something on here. You know, say, this is, this is where Grandma lived. Or uh, I've got Annie up right here in the center. But this is sort of one of those working documents. I'm like, you know, People that know stuff, you want to drop a pin on here and say this is 
This is this was important. This was where this is where I grew up. But uh, we we do all kinds of mapping, whether it's on paper or it's digital. But we want to keep doing this as long as we can. So thank you for having me. Stick around for any questions. Yeah. So when you were talking about the road, it would have run like right here alongside that road that doesn't exist it anymore? It would have been your property line. Wow. Yeah. I think afterwards I might take care, I might walk over there and take a look, see if there's anything there. Yeah. But, uh, but that's, that's just one of the benefits of it, you know? You get to figure out exactly where things were that are not there today. So it's not just about, you know, who owned the land at this point, you know, we could look at it and say, oh, wow, there's a road there, who knew? Or there was a house there. And in fact, did you mention uh, the wharf, this, this road right here, the mm -hmm. wharf? Do you know roughly on the creek where it was? Yeah, so this, so if you go down Fairfield Lane, you're going down, you go into the field, you bear left, and then you bear right, you're rejoining that old road. So if that road that then goes to Fairfield, extended on that that's where it is and so basically it goes exactly to where the, the wharf is um, if you're going down to Fairfield right before you take that final right turn and you're there you're at the house it's there no and I I never actually thought about that till about 20 minutes ago mm -hmm. but that road sure enough it goes straight to the wharf and uh, the road to Fairfield nowadays if you're standing at the main house, and you look down the road, you draw a straight line, it goes exactly to Abington Church. But this road, a couple hundred feet south, went straight to the wharf. So we sort of wonder, why was that? Were there two roads? Was one road the main road where the, the people that lived at the main house would, that was their view, but then you had a second road, and maybe that was different people experienced on that road. It's just big questions we don't know the answers on. You mentioned before about um, having people put put having people put on the map that grandma would have cares from that nature. But it's interesting, my family and I have been to some places in the area mm -hmm. and a lot of their restaurants were passed down. So I know that there is a diner on the main road Also, it's it's a living map too. You know, it's not it's not there's not a you know 15 minutes and then we're taking it away. I mean, you know, these are just tools we're just trying to keep alive. I, I have a suggestion for y'all that would sure. probably help. Um, my family originated from here, by the way. Um, they came in okay. at the beginning in Jamestown. Wow. So I'm a monkey, but I'm also of the colonists as well. Mm -hmm. um, the Buchanan family has a lot of history from okay. ages ago, right here in Gloucester County. Okay. What I would like to do is, is um, if y'all are interested, is hook you up with, with my cousin, okay. my second Great. and my third cousin, because I know they can tell you a lot about this. The whole of Gloucester. Oh, sure, well, that'd be great. Yeah. They knew the original family set. Okay. Well, so, if we have a business card, I'll be sure to get that to yeah. you. That'd be great. It's always good to connect, you know. Yeah, and and I'm I'm curious myself. Oh sure. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of stuff has happened right here in this area. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Sarah. Yeah. So, what is specifically your next step? I mean, you look through like the land records, the flat maps, things like that. Is there something else that you're like really looking to get your hands on? You know, is oral history the next step? What's well, oral history is always probably one of the most important things um, in terms of getting, getting people's voice out there. But um, as far as what I will probably do, it, it's tricky. You know, sometimes you think you've done all you can do. We've looked through a lot of the survey books. We've not solved all the riddles. Um, that's a really good question. I think I'm going to have to say oral histories. Just wait and see what people have to say. 
Oh, I think it was Sam in a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, super interesting presentation. I really appreciate all the work that's gone into this. I guess I'm wondering, I've been trying to do a similar mapping exercise, more related to the lands, I guess, just down the creek towards Shelley, okay. Rosewell. And so I guess I, I wonder, is, uh, as you've been going through this, is there like a is there like a methodology that, in addition to the resources and the outputs that you put together, is there like a methodology that you could like recommend to other folks who want to like extend the geography? Well, that's a tricky one. Uh, in the past, we've sort of handled it on a case-by-case -case basis. So we'll say, you know, we're interested in, uh, say we had an oral history and this, so there's a cemetery on this one parcel about a mile down the road. Uh, we, we did some title work on that. We looked at that area. But what we did was we, we looked at who owned the parcel today and just traced it backwards. But then we also want to go and make sure that it goes all the way to the very back, to the very beginning of the time, you know, the pearls or whoever on the property. Um, but that, that's a really tricky question because there, there's a lot of mistakes you'll make, you know, because it's, I mean, it's, it's so dense. You know, all the different people that didn't own land and all the different companies out there, you know, mutual societies and things like that. Maybe land was owned briefly by a mortgage company. But that's a really tough question, and I have to think on that a little bit more. The other, my other maybe more of a suggestion is thinking about, and this might come out of some of the oral histories, um, but some of those other mutual ownership associations. Uh, one that I'm particularly interested in is the Gloucester Land Building Loan Association. Oh, right. uh, T.C. Walker's Association, among others. I believe my grandfather was also partners in that. And those entities, as I understand, made it their business to acquire land and then redistribute that land to primarily to other black families and communities. So I feel like that could be a way of um, Sort of another avenue into understanding what the network of relationships were that that yeah. uh, important part of the story. Yeah, I'm thinking right now how how incredible it'd be to go to the, you know, and just document as many, many of those records as you can, and then maybe map out where it all was and try to establish a pattern or any sort it's, of. It's going, it's going on right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great to help. Oh, sorry. I think I failed you to come to that question. Uh, <coughs> if you plan on. Um, this little presentation you had, so you got some interesting maps in there. I'm sorry, what was the? You plan on having it printed? Oh, uh, no, but I'm happy to any of it. Yeah, we can. We can. Are you suggesting you do a book? Well, <laughs> I have to get through supper first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, I do work in another historic property, and. It was not one that was generational like some of these other larger plantations. And with this property, there's rentals. There are people who rented the land. So oh, yeah. how does that impact the Piney Swamp area? It makes it really difficult because the rental records are not really a thing. And it's a bummer. Mortgage records are out there, but rental records are just not. As a renter myself, that's OK. <laughs> but, you know, it would be wonderful to know because, you know, I should have included the picture in here. We have a picture, and actually Sarah had me print off a copy of it. I can, I can pull it out in a minute. But one of the pictures of Fairfield, one of the only pictures, I think there's seven pictures, but one of them actually shows a, an African-American lady on the porch. And we don't know who it is. It's because she may have been a rare. And so, unless we can find those records, it's just a massive void. And also, um, if any structures are still alive, and I mean, mm -hmm. still standing, and you can still see them and walk in them, sometimes the folks left their mark. Oh, sure. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there's any of those structures that have any kind of marks of who lived there, because that was ha that happened in the house that we have on the property. Well, there aren't many. Uh, you know, structures from that era still around, except for Antioch. The graveyard in the back is a good example of that. The names in stone. 
but, but what you're talking about specifically, it would be great. So like I know that tax assessors and things like that sometimes would leave their autograph on the walls of the place. That oh, that's be. interesting. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Where to look though. Yeah, we'll always, we'll always be looking at, you know, Fairfield Bricks, if, you know, say there's a name on there somewhere, but, you know, Antioch Church is one of the oldest structures in the area. It's over 100 years old. Uh, you know, the, the cornerstone out there is there to prove it. I'm sure there's some, I'm sure some of the folks that helped build this building left their mark somewhere, too. A lot of the families here in Gloucester were buried on their land. Right. I'm sure y'all are aware of that. Um, my mother, before she passed away, would tell me that there was a certain kind of flower that they would find in woods. And what that meant, if that flower was there, was that there were graves there of their loved ones. Periwinkle. Yeah, yes, yes. So what you're going to find is as you start talking to the families themselves, um, and I will give you that information for um, you, yeah. my, my relative. And also keep in mind with periwinkle, yeah. if it's had a chance to grow out, it'll go away from yeah. the site itself. So you may not see it at the site itself over time. Right. It'll grow out like a carpet and keep going. Yeah, yeah. we've got family right now in King and Queen where three relatives were buried right there. And my mom showed them to me, but the periwinkle has gone. And here's another thought. I don't know how folks feel about this, but in the site that I have been working with, we've used cadaver dogs, and these these dogs are very well trained. We've been they've been on the property three times. We have confirmed oral histories of sites, of burial sites. So we had we had eight on our list and only two were confirmed. And so we confirmed um, five for sure. And one of them, we could not confirm it. But then we had them come back and based on archeological evidence that we have um, known and knew there were other sites, we took those dogs. We did not give them any kind of direction. They work, they know what they're supposed to do, and we let them go. And they were able to find additional graves. Whether or not they're enslaved, we're not sure, but nearby we found plant life that we knew had to have been intentionally planted because they're not native. For instance, we were in the woods not far from another burial site, and we found a grove of Mahoney holly. Mahoney holly is very expensive. It is not native like, like you see in the woods, and it looks very different. So when we let the dogs go there, we found another burial. So there's so many different things that can help piece together, and I encourage you, if you think that you are interested in that, I can hook you up with those resources. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, there's all kinds, all kinds of uh, avenues of interrogation out there, so to speak. <laughs> Investigation, I should say. Yeah. But cemeteries are a very, very interesting one. Um, on the Fairfield Plantation in the surrounding area, we know, we know of very few cemeteries, but we know there are more. So, and we want to make sure that uh, for their own protection, they're protected and saved and, and known made known so nothing bad happens to them. Uh, if, a, if a highway comes through at the wrong spot. But see sorry. the thing of it is, if we can identify those, then we can put them in Vicris. That's right. And then that way, if mm -hmm. folks come in and they want to do work and they see that it's on Vicris, they've you know, done their background check, then they know that they have to do certain things before plowing ahead. And that's a big part of what we try to do as Fairfield is try to make sure that things are preserved and protected as they as they need to be. So yeah, thank you all.